Hello viewers and uh, welcome to Reminiscences with Professor Tajuddin Badomasi, who is a professor of history, who has spent uh, most of his working life at the University of Lagos, where we are in Yaba here. Uh, he, he was uh, head of the department of uh, history, the dean of the faculty of arts, among other responsibilities in the university. Outside the campus, he is a well-known writer of many books, as you'll hear, and also an, a leader in the Islamic community. Indeed, he's still the president of the Muslim community of Lagos. Prof, welcome to the program. And as usual, I'd like to start by asking about your early life. Thank you very much, sir. I'm delighted to be on this program. And I have I've heard much about it. And it's a pleasure and an honor for me to feature on it. I wish the organization many years of fruitful service to the profession and to the nation. About my early life, well, I was born in 1939, and that's about 84 years ago. 39. Mm. 1939. And I was born in a very famous city, Ondo, mm. in Ondo State. I was happy I was born there. Because this is a community that cherishes values, family values, social values, and ethical values. And I love the city of Undo. I'm tempted to ask what, what is famous, famous about it. What is uh, famous about Undo? Undo is a very big city and one of the most ancient cities in the Southwest. It had a long tradition of monarchs dating back to the 15th century. And here is a city that treasures its history, its traditions and values. Mm. And I'm happy to have grown up in that environment. Mm. Because that was my first introduction, as it were, mm. to history, African history. Mm. I had my primary school, my secondary school, part of my secondary school, at one, at one of the oldest secondary schools in that city. It's called Undo Bosa High School. It was founded the year I was born, in 1939. <laughs> and I attended that school. And I was a prefect throughout, <laughs> my, throughout my career there, finally becoming the head boy at the senior prefect mm. in my final year. And on leaving on the bus high school, I went to King's College for my higher school certificates. In Lagos, yeah. In Lagos, yeah. Yes. And I'm really delighted <coughs> to have that wonderful opportunity of attending that College of Distinction. So I'm proud that I attended bus high school and I'm even more proud that I attended King's College Lagos. And from King's College Lagos, I was admitted to University College of Ibadan, as it was then known, to read history. Needless to say, that was the only church institution we have at that time in Nigeria. And we had a fantastic time mm. with them. And I'm finishing at University of Ibadan in 1962. Let me ask, what attracted you to the study of history? You could have, in those days, indeed, many young people want to do professional courses. Yes. Why, why history? Why history? I found that I had a flair for it, a natural flair for it. Mm. And this was probably I don't know whether to say it is uh, it's in my genes, because my parents were noted for 
their knowledge of their community and of their environment. My mother was a fantastic historian. He knew the history of everybody in that in that area, and he also he also knew the history of wherever she was. So it was natural for me, since I was very close to my parents, to pick that up from her. Was she a teacher, or is just now you know a community? Well, so she was just a trader. Yeah, yeah. she was a trader. Yeah. But then she was often in, in relationship with very many people. Mm. Uh, and she, as I've said, she treasures people, mm. she knows their background, she knows their history, and she relates beautifully well with them. Mm. And that predisposed me to studying people and to studying my environment and be able to relate to it. Mark, as you said, my many of my friends wanted to go for medicine, mm. they wanted to go for law, etc. In fact, I was thinking, well, why shouldn't I go for law? You thought of law? I thought of law. Yeah. I thought of law. Uh, but then, uh, and my teachers were already saying, okay, if you want to go for law, you have to go abroad. Said, why not? Why shouldn't I go abroad for law? Mm. Because there was, no, there, 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 was, there was no provision for legal studies. In, in Ibadan then? At Ibadan at that yeah. time. Was there a challenge for you to get funding to go abroad? I beg your pardon? Was it a challenge for you to get the funding? It was a challenge. It was a challenge. Abroad, it yeah. was a challenge to go abroad. Yes. And I discovered that really, without much effort, mm. I would score high marks and high grades in his history. Mm. Without much effort. Mm. Without much effort. So I said, well, isn't this a clear indication mm. that my talent is along this side mm. and that we try and develop it? That's how I entered the School of History. Right. And I was happy that I did it. Yeah. When you finish your first degree, a lot of people in your generation who studied at the university will quickly get top jobs in the civil service. Yes. Why, why didn't you go that way? I, I'm not the type that, that I want to think outside the box. Mm. And I don't want to be too much confined by rules and regulations that I cannot understand. Mm. So I felt that if I were to do, if I were to do my masters if I have to do my PhD then I'll be in the world of learning and I will be, be able to pursue knowledge as far as I want I'll be able to say what I want to say I'll be able to keep to the results of my research I'll be able to maintain my independence and I will not be too much fettered by various regulations so I found it more attractive for me to remain in academics to me remain in the realm of knowledge where I can do my research, follow the results of my research, and publish my research. I found that much more enticing than being a pen pusher in the civil service. <laughs> you did your PhD in Ibadan also? I did my PhD in Ibadan when the university became University of Ibadan. Mm. I graduated in UCI, mm. University College of Ibadan, which was a college of London, University of London. Yeah. And I did my PhD in the fully developed University of Ibadan. Mm. And why, I that I did Why it. did you move to the University of Lagos for mo much of your teaching career? Because I was fascinated by Lagos. My fascination was that here was a new university that was being started. It started in 1962. And I said, if I were to remain in the University of Ibadan with all my teachers there, <laughs> they were also receiving me as their student. Mm. <laughs> so the place was becoming fossilized. Mm. Whereas if I were to move to a new university, then there would be a lot of room for enterprise. Mm. You'll be able to introduce courses, you'll be able to uh, develop curriculum, you'll be able to do your research. And I can always link up with Nibada, where my teachers are, mm. and my, some of my colleagues are, for whatever I may need them for. And I'm happy that I took that decision. Because by the time I got to the University of, University of Lagos, I was able to introduce new courses. And one of the courses I introduced was, I introduced a course on the history of Lagos. I introduced a course also on Afro-Islamic civilization. I also introduced a course on Islamic political thought. These are courses that had remained in the University of Ibadan it would have been a bit tougher for me to introduce them. Unfortunately for me, 
the head of the department at that time was not only a scholar, he was very broad-minded. Mm -hmm. I encouraged us to introduce courses, which are not available in other universities, so that the university can make a name for itself for the programs that they run. This is how we were able to develop courses on economic history. Mm -hmm. We were able to develop programs on international relations, courses that were not yet available in the old citadel of learning at the University of Ibadan. Mm -hmm. So you yourself became the head of the Department of History. Yes. Later, the dean of the Faculty of Arts, yes. University of Lagos. Um, was it uh, challenging being a scholar and being an administrator at the same time, or is it something you just found in your stride? It was challenging, but I must say I thank the good Lord for giving me, for making me for enabling me to decide your responsibilities. It was extremely arduous. Uh, for example, uh, when I became the Dean of Arts, the Lagos State Government appointed me as the Chairman of the Lagos State Muslim Pilgrims Welfare Board. This was the board that was in charge of organizing Lesa Hajj and Hajj itself for the large number of pilgrims in Lagos State. Now, combining that assignment with my responsibilities as Dean of Arts was not a joke. It meant my working very hard, days on end, from one meeting to another meeting, meeting that will last hours upon hours. But I thank the good Lord who made it possible for me to combine the responsibilities of academics with the responsibilities of public service. And uh, uh, the, 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 people, the people that served outside the university were happy that they were interacting with a scholar, and the people in the university were happy that they had practical experience of life. Mm. Uh, so it worked out beautifully well for me. Mm. Uh, and I look back on those years with joy and with a great bit of with joy and with gratitude to the good Lord for the immense assistance I had in being able to carry out those responsibilities. Are you disappointed that you didn't rise beyond the dean for the other DV, deputy vice chancellor, chan vice chancellor? As a brilliant scholar, uh, was, was it something that you that was within your your expectation? Yes, uh, most scholars would want to become vice chancellors because that's the top of the situation. And people like us are fortunate not only to be an academic but also to be somewhat relevant in the public sector. We thought we had something to offer. But they don't come my way. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a time when I was offered the person of a deputy vice chancellorship uh, one of our universities. But I didn't want to go there as a deputy. Mm. If I were to leave the status of a dean of arts, I wanted to be a vice chancellor state. Mm. Because I know that a deputy is a deputy. Mm. And his powers are very much limited. He will not be able to do what he wants to do. He has to defer to his boss mm. as the vice chancellor. So I didn't take that, up, take that off our Maybe I should have, because it would have made my becoming a VC a bit easier. Mm. Uh, but I didn't do that. Mm. Uh, so I did not become a vice chancellor, but then I had no regrets. So, so your career in the university, once you became the dean, was it at the point from that point you retired or you, you stayed on as a professor? Of oh, I stayed on. I stayed on. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you can be a dean for one term or two terms maximally. Mm. And I didn't want to serve more than one term, mm. but then the people said I should go for a second term, and now that was enough for me. And when I finished my term as dean of arts, I remained in the institution, I remained in the department, and continued to do my research work. I continued to teach, mm. and I enjoyed it very much. One of the things you have done, which is uh, quite unusual for an academic, is that you have written books that are accessible to the public, mm. especially biographies yes. of prominent people. Yes. 
Biographies are very interesting. Biographies are very interesting. You want to read about the famous people who had had tremendous impact on their society. You wanted to know how did they do it? What were the challenges? What are the opportunities? And what were the effects of the action? So it's very fascinating. Unfortunately, we have very few biographies of Nigerians. And I thought it's high time we studied our distinguished people so that people who are coming behind them could learn about them and see the type of impact they have made on their own society. So it was an attempt to fill a gap in knowledge, to advance knowledge as it were. So in that sense, it was academic. But then it was also a matter of public service. That this, this, these are eminent men and women. People talk about them. People relate to them. They mentor so many people. They've had tremendous influence on their society. I, should, I want to know more about them. I want to relate to them. And sometimes even they even approached me that I should come and write their biographies. Or friends approach me, why don't you come and write the biography with this guy? So both combined uh, academic interest and public interest. Mm. And I found the characters very interesting, extremely interesting. Can you, can you give us a brief snippet on Fala Uyo? Yes. What, what makes him what remarkable? Yes. And then Odutola, a lot yes. of people probably will not have heard his name. So yes. let's, can you give us... Uh, yes, uh, about, Odutu, about uh, Fala Uyo, when I wrote his book, I called it Divine Stock Exchange. Now, why did I choose Divine Stock Exchange? Uh, all of us know what, the red, what stock exchanges are. You buy shares, you buy stocks, uh, you trade with them, and you may lose, you may gain. Sometimes the stock exchange itself collapses, either in Nigeria or London or New York, anywhere. Stock exchanges do crash. But I named that of Kolawiyo trading on a divine stock exchange. What is divine stock exchange? What inspired me was what I read in the Quran and what I learned from my sheikh. I, I can put it simply in Yoruba language. They say, Abolon Shuwu, Kine Padanu. I.e., if you trade with your Lord, you will not regret, you will not lose. Mm. Now, Fola Uyo was virtually the chief launcher of Nigeria. He was invited to various ceremonies, various occasions where he is the chief launcher, and he would spend money generously. Mm. He built mosques everywhere, in many places, from Lagos to, I think, Kaduna, Kaduna mm. everywhere. Not to talk of a large number of people whom he helped. Mm. Where did he get the money? Business. Mm. He, was a, he was a successful businessman. Mm. And he was, spending, he was a great philanthropist. Mm. Here was a man who traded with his Lord. Mm. He did not expect any return from the people he was serving. Mm. And I said, here is a man who was engaging in divine stock exchange that mm. will never crash. Mm. And uh, I'm happy that uh, the man led a very good life. Mm. He was respected throughout his life. Mm. And he became the Baba genie of Lagos, mm. i.e. the, 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 the main patron. Mm. And he had also a number of national honors, mm. uh, O.N., etc. Mm. What about Odutola? Odutola, he was a very virtuous man, mm. a man who was very upright, who, held, who had high moral principles. Mm. Uh, I talked about Ondo being an ancient city. Mm having values and having tradition. Mm. Odutola was also from Ijebode, an ancient city. And the man shared the tradition and the values of Ijebode. Of Ijebode. Mm. He was a successful businessman. He never cheated. And no person, he did not cheat, and he did not allow himself to be cheated. <laughs> and he was, in, he was in business, and he tackled everything business-like. A self-made man who was able to build up his good, his name 
and his own business empire. Mm. So I have great, he's a man of great respect, a man of value, a very virtuous businessman. And he's a, he's a rare bird. Mm. Many businessmen will cut corners. Ototala will never cut corners. Mm. I did not cheat anybody. What, I, what, 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 was business, what business was he? I remember him with tires. What, what business That's was, right. Yes. He was in the tire business, mm. which he ran for a number of years. He was also in textiles. He was an importer and an exporter. And to my surprise, when I worked on his biography, he also dealt with gold. Gold? Gold, yes. Mm. He went to Elisha, and he was dealing in gold over there for some time before he left the place, when it became a little bit too dangerous for him. So that was his line of business. Mm. And he, he faced his business very squarely and very successfully. Mm. Uh, he was also a philanthropist because he helped quite a large number of people. He trained all his children. Mm. Uh, and you may want to know that one of his children became a professor. Mm. That was uh, Professor Clark, Professor Mrs. Clark. Uh, that was a famous, he was, an, he was an actress. He was also a professor of English. And he became professor of English in the University of Lagos. One of the books he has written is on the history of Islam in Yoruba land. And I wonder, what, what, what's, uh, what's, what, what are the nuggets from that history? We know there are a lot of Muslims in Yoruba land, but, and there are, of course, all sorts of uh, stories about how the Jihad brought Islam to Yoruba land. What, what is the essence? How did Islam come here? And what is its ex the extent of its spread in Yoruba land? That's a very fascinating situation. How did Islam come to Yoruba land? In the course of my research, or my PhD, I did work on the issue of Islam in Yoruba land. And one of the things I was surprised to find out was that Islam had been in Yoruba land before the jihad. This is surprising to me. Like many people, I did believe before then that it was the Sokumi Jihad that brought Islam into the world, land, making a learning more or less like the base for the spread of Islam in the world. Land. But that's not so. One of the things I discovered was that, in fact, Islam came from across the seas to, to Yoruba land, actually to Lagos and to Baghdad. How? During the wars that took place in Yoruba land, some of them were captured and were sold into slavery to Brazil and other parts of the world. Since they, they were Muslim before they left Nigeria, and when they got to the foreign lands, they retained their religion. And when they were freed, eventually they were emancipated, they came back with their religion back to Yoruba. So Islam came, you know, as Islam had been in Yoruba, that proves that Islam had been in Yoruba before the jihad. And then Islam came again to Yoruba from across the seas. And their presence is still felt even now in Lagos and Baghdad. That is one. Two, before the Jihad itself, in many parts, even in the in, 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 in your empire in particular, we had ample evidence that Islam was present there. They had imams, they had their past, they had congregations, and we're happy about it to know this. In fact, in some writings, in some writings by the by, by our scholars, scholars from northern Nigeria in particular, they did refer to the presence of some scholars in Yoruba land. And they linked up with them. One of them was Alimi. 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 In the lorry. In the lorry. And he was not alone. In the Gomosha, in other parts of the empire, there were also notable Muslim practitioners. They may be advanced, but they were there. Before they, the jihad. Before the jihad. They were there, undoubtedly so. 
and I was satisfied that I was able to get this information. But on top of the linguistic evidence that we have, in Yoruba land, for example, Islam is not called Islam. It's called Imandi, Imandi. And when you begin to trace this, you find that there was evidence that some people have got, have been, who have been trading after Yoruba land, they been to Mali, they been to Songhai, and they brought some knowledge of Islam to them with their words. You know, they, they did not only bring salt, they did not only bring uh, uh, leather works, they also brought Islam with them to various parts of the northeastern part of the Royal Empire. So it was called in Malay, i.e. not knowledge that, knowledge that is hard, but people from Mali. Okay. That's why it was called in Malay mm. at that time. So there's a lot of evidence to show that Islam had been present in Yoruba land because it's so good to have. Indeed, you could say that the jihad at first had a negative influence on the course of Islam Yoruba land and eventually a very positive influence. The negative influence was that the, the wars caused a lot of disruption. Disaster followed the wars. Towns were destroyed. People left their homes. People fled everywhere. And therefore, people said, Oh, what is all this? What's all this? What's all this? So they were not too happy with what some of the Muslim warriors mm. did to them. Mm. But when things settled down, when things settled down and there was peace, the people began to see the beauty in Islam. And it place like a glory became what we can call the Biki that transmitted the light of Islam to Rubala. So how did how did then Lagos, for example, became a substantially Muslim community? Became a substantial Muslim community partly because of the returnees that I mentioned. They are mm. called returnees. Mm. I people who were Muslims before they became, they were exported. They were sold into slavery, into the Western world. And when they came back, they brought their Islam with them. One good example here is Elijah Augusto. 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 Mm. Basil Augusto. Mm. He, he became a lawyer. Augusto sounds like a Brazilian name. Brazilian. Mm. It is a Brazilian. Mm. Which have become part of the Lagos family. Mm. He, he Alaji Basil Augusto, was a lawyer. He studied in London. And he became back, he came back and he had tremendous influence on the development of Islam in Lagos State. Generally in Nigeria. And he was the founder of Jamaat Islamia, which exists today. Really so the return of the, the return of the, the, the return of the, the, they are called returnees. Mm. The, I don't say the return of the returnees, mm. but the effects of the returnees in Lagos have been very tremendous, mm. uh, as I said, as exemplified in the case of uh, mm. Alaji Basil Augusto. Mm. Also, Lagos was a commercial center. Mm. It had a port, and it attracted people from there. From the hinterland, mm. people came to trade, and when they, when they, the people in the interior, when they came, they settled in the region, they get on well. Islam, Islam ascended. Mm. Uh, one thing that had assisted the growth of Islam in Lagos is the patronage of those in authority. The, the monarchs or the others, the kings, who accepted Islam facilitated the spread of the religion. For example, uh, one of the kings, Abbas Abusi, he had an appellation of uh, of Atike Yasi, Afibi Oba Tonke Yasi, Ape, the distinguished and the refined Oba. 
who can recite the Swap in Yasi and the Koran? That is Obusi. Mm. And that is the father of Prince Obusi mm. in there, mm. who himself remains a highly committed Muslim leader. Mm. So the influence, the point I'm trying to make is that the, some, of the, some of the political authorities, the, the people who have power, the people who have influence, who have money, supported the cause of Islam or they embrace Islam themselves. And this had a tremendous impact on the spread of Islam in Lagos. So we have the effect of the returnees, as exemplified in the case of Basila Pusto. We have the, the, the influence of people like of others, uh, and a good example is that of Sanusia as well. Then above all, above all, there are some prominent leaders who had money and who devoted their wealth to the spread of Islam. A good case here is the case of a uh, 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 very good friend, a very distinguished family, Chitabe. Mm. Chitabe was a successful businessman and he built a mosque in the 19th century that became very famous. It was the best mosque, the best mosque at that time. And it attracted attention, so much international attention that the Sultan of Turkey sent a special representative to go and open that mosque. This was 1896. 19? 1896. 1896. And I'm happy that, I'm happy that the Abdullah Kila, who came to represent him at that time, conferred the title of B. The title of B. It's a Turkish title. Okay, yes. So, well, yeah, Shita B. Shita B. It's, 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 a, it's a Turkish. Uh, yes. Mm. No, his name was Shita. Shita, yes. But B was B is the title. Mm. Was, that was conferred on mm. him. So they said Shita B. Mm. And that name still sticks it today. Mm. These are the things that helped the cause of Islam yes. in the state. But with the coming of colonialism and Christian Christian missionary, did it suppress Islamic uh, spread and influence in Lagos and out in the Southwest? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that the Christians, of course, wanted to spread their religion quite naturally. That's why they were here. Mm -hmm. They are missionaries. And they try to pay attention to converting people not only from the traditional religion, but also adherents of Islam to become Muslims. Mm. That is normal. To become Christians. To become Christians. Right. That's to be expected. It's not, un it's, it's not unnatural. Mm. So it was a threat to them. Mm. Christianity, too, the, the, you know, so the, the uh, colonialism, the British people who colonize us. They are Christians. Mm. Practicing practice Christians for that matter too. Mm. And therefore, the combination of Christians and the, and the colonial authorities mm. pose a great challenge to the advance of Islam in Lagos. Mm. And I said no earlier on. Mm. Because when for two reasons, one, so Muslims do not want to be converted to, to, to Christianity. Mm. They, res they resisted it. Make some converted, change their names, etc. But some did not want to change to Christianity at all. They wanted to remain as Muslims. The result was that they did not attend the schools that were established by the Christian missionaries. They kept away from it. But they know that if they attended, they will be converted there. They kept the report. But then the colonial government was not happy that a section of the population was not imbibing on Western education. Mm. And they rose to the, the challenge. They discussed with the Imam, they discussed with the Muslim leaders. Why are you not attending our school? Why? What can we do? Fortunately, the solution was found. The government decided to establish a school where 
Christianity will not be taught. The schools will be run partially by government and partially by the Muslim community. And they will teach Islam there. It was called the Government Muslim School. And it was a successful experiment in Lagos. And the success enabled the federal government to introduce that system in the other parts of the Kalan. So they have more people being able to keep their religion at the same time being able to imbibe with an education. You have studied on Sarudin, of course. You yes. actually wrote about it. Uh, you say it's something that fascinates you. Yes. What, what is the contribution of Asaruddin to the society as, as, as a movement or as a group? The, 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 the contribution of Asaruddin to society has been, in my humble opinion, has been enormous. One, they've offered Western education to the Muslims. But for Asaruddin, many educated Muslims today will not have been educated. They founded second primary schools, they founded secondary schools, and they made people remain that retain their religion. And they were proud of their religion. In my humble opinion, a good problem. One, one example of the side of this is a person like uh, Alagi Femi Okuni. His father was one of the early members of Ansari Wedges family. I think he was in charge of education. And he himself remained a Muslim, even though he made a Muslim, even though he was educated. And he eventually became the president of Ansari Society of Nigeria. That's the type of thing we are talking about. That, but for Ansari Dean, but for Ansari Dean, they don't have received the they don't have received Western education and they don't have been able to attain what they were able to attain in the world. And they tried to give it back when he became successful and to develop the Muslim community in the state. So Asharuddin have been the purveyor of Western education amongst Muslims, not only in Lagos, but also far and above, far and below Lagos. Exactly. Prof, you yourself, you have been an Islamic activist in addition to being a scholar. Where did this start? When, when this activism? Is it from university or? From, I would say it's from the university. Mm. When I was at the Babi. Mm. Uh, I did not become a member of the MSS, mm. but I knew about the Muslim, Muslim Student Society, Student Society right. which was founded by a colleague of mine. Uh, Dr. Latifa Debuter. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a few years ahead of me in King's College mm -hmm. and he went about to study. But in the University of Ibadan, when I learned more and more about Islam, I got more and more fascinated. Mm -hmm. It is most thrilling. I was very grateful to my good Lord that I did it. Mm -hmm. Can I narrate a little experience that I have? Yes. Here? When I finished, I did my PhD on the growth of Islam in Yoruba land. On the? The growth of Islam. The growth of Islam in Yoruba land. In Yoruba land. Yes. That was the topic. Mm. I submitted it mm. and I was thoroughly tired and thoroughly happy that mm. I left to do the work. Mm. I then took a copy to meet my parents who are then based in Yoruba. Mm. I cannot forget the scene that I put. Mm. I told my daddy that here is the work I have done in the University of Ibadan mm. for my PhD. Mm. My father was very pleased and he said it up prayers for me. Mm. When I gave, showed it to my mommy, mm. she goes into tears. I rolled on the ground. Mm. Mommy, mommy said, Was he? What? And he said, said yes. The half father had prayed. I've been praying mm. that had, had oh, that one of his children mm. to do what I have not done. Mm. Now, she, my mother, who was the daughter, mm. could not do it. Mm. But as the son of my mother, mm. and I've answered the prayers of my grandparents, mm. 
uh, they wanted somebody who would work on the forest of Islam. Mm. And I was very pleased that, mm. well, I'm going to try it. It mm. has to be that mm. what my grandparents wanted, without my knowing it, I'd be able to do it. Mm. And now, what I'm trying to say is that my exposure, my learning about Islam, my working on Islam, let me see the beauty of the religion. Mm. And I knew it, and I tried to practice to the best of my ability. Mm. And by the time I came to the University of Lagos, I was invited here and there. Was it was it a hindrance to your professional career to be a Muslim activist? Did you pay a price? I paid a price because I was approaching a society in an environment that was largely Christian, mm. and I cannot say that I'm not faced. Challenges. Mm. I will not use the word discrimination, mm. but at least face challenges. Mm. Uh, for example, when I was in the University of Lagos as a professor, we normally appoint the most senior professor as a dean of arts. Mm. This was the custom. Mm. Then, when I became the most senior professor, I had challenges. Mm. I thought it would be automatic for me to become the dean of arts. Mm. I was most in the process, and that's happened the tradition. Mm. Well, like you believe it or not, people said, ah, no, 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 ah, uh ah, -uh, uh -uh. He said, ah, oh. if, if I appoint this man, that be the the professor wrote down, self professor wrote down, if he became a dean of arts and allow Professor Adao, was a vice chancellor at that time, then it means that we are being governed by Muslims, that anything they want to do, a Muslim have to approve at the level of faculty. Mm -hmm. And then at the level of the university, is also a Muslim. How can, how can we allow that? No, let's have a Christian as a, let's have a Christian. As a dean of us, and then we can then tackle the issue of uh, the Muslim as a person. It became an issue. Mm -hmm. And people told me, well, probably I don't to step down. Step mm -hmm. down? No way. I said, for years, I told them that for years, the VC have been a Christian, and the dean of us had also been a Christian. Who didn't complain? Mm -hmm that our affairs have been governed at those two levels by Christians. Mm. We complied with them, we cooperated with them. And they know how much cooperation I gave to some of them. So if it's now Muslim Muslim at the level of the faculty and at the level of the university, that's no big deal. We are not here as uh, to go and the I mean, Muslim Muslim. <laughs> it, it's, it's, not, it's not a religious issue. Mm. The most senior professor becomes the dean, and I'm the most senior professor. And the government had appointed the VC because of his merit. So it's, it's not a bit of a religion. What happened? At that time, I happened to be the chairman of the Lagos State Prison Prefer Board. And it was time for me to go to lead the legation, to lead the Muslims. The group of Muslims going on hard to Mecca and Medina. And I went. Before I came back, the election took place. And I won by the Supreme Majority. In your absence? In my absence. Mm -hmm. I was on that when the, when, the, when the election took place. Mm -hmm. When the people saw that uh, they would do the right thing and they did the right thing, mm -hmm. I would take them. Yeah. But they were challenging Yes. But what the challenge was because yes. a lot of uh, someone took now, now you are an elder in, in, in Lagos. Indeed, you are the president of the Muslim community of Lagos. What, what do you do in that role? What, what does that mean? The, the Muslim community of Lagos State offers a platform for all Muslims in the state to be together, to pool resources together in order to address common issues. Common issues in education, common issues in the ethical field, common issues of interest to Muslims generally. 
and I'm, this is following the tradition that has been established in Dago State itself. In fact, we live in the same world because the council is the divine council is that there should be unity. Go separate yourselves. You are one. Remain as one, and do not be divided. That's why the Nigerian Supreme Council of Islamic Affairs emerged. That's why the World Muslim League emerged. I would feel that at the state level, we should also form, have a platform where the Muslims can come together, exchange experiences, pull resources together for a common thing. That's what we do. Hmm. You are still a very youthful 84. <laughs> um, so I wonder, what do, what do you do now in, in retirement? What what How do you occupy your days? How do I occupy my days? Mm. I put it differently. Mm. My days are heavily occupied. Mm. Heavily occupied. Mm. I have to do some amount of academy, some amount of research, some amount of publishing. You still I'll, write books? Oh, I see, I see. Book. I still mm. do my research. Work. Mm. I'm the such assistant. Mm. I have a secretary, mm. uh, and I have a number of projects that I do, mm. which I publish from time to time. Thank the good Lord. Mm. At the same time, I also had pay some of my time for any service to the community at large, mm. especially to the Muslim group, mm. uh, in order to solve some of our problems. Mm. Uh, this kept me extremely busy. Mm. Extremely busy. Mm. And I'm happy about it. Mm. Uh, one, because I believe that I do something very useful. And two, I believe that by the time I return to my Lord, I'll say I've got my place. Mm. <laughs> I'll claim mm -hmm. and I'll praise that I've got my place. Mm -hmm. that is it rewarding for you so adaptive? Because retirement is retirement. There is an issue of how do you make a living? Pensions are not enough. How, how, how are you able to take care of yourself among this plethora of activities? Well, the good Lord provides. Mm. And I have no cause to complain at all. The good Lord has been extremely beneficial to me. Extremely massive. It's as if to say, the good Lord does nothing but to attend to you. Mm. <laughs> uh, and he has also surrounded me with people who are very careful and very loyal. Mm. Very careful, very loyal. And this is just one example. Um, it's a pity that we do not put in here my, what they call my legal, mm. my security man at the gate. Mm. He's been with me now for about 20 years, mm. rendering excellent service. Mm. Absolutely no complaint about it. He doesn't speak over. I don't speak outside. Mm. He knows he's, he, he told me he's partially full of Mm. And I don't know the language, mm. but he's an excellent person. Mm. I remember one year when he was when he wanted to go up, when he wanted to go home to so not be eat prayers and do some family work. He was preparing to go, but like that was the time my wife died then. Mm. He did not go home. Mm. He stayed with God. It was as if his own mother had died. Mm. And he felt that he cannot leave the family like that. Mm. Now, when you have that type of person surrounding you, mm. it makes your retirement beautiful. Mm. No person is stabbing you at the back. Mm. No person is pulling you to walk under your feet. Mm. Whether they see you or they don't see you, they do their best. Mm. And of course, some members of the family rally around you to ensure mm. that. Are perfectly mm. cooking mm. and they have been really very wonderful. Mm. You the support, the support from staff, the support from the society, are wonderful. Mm. And I thank, I thank them all. How is family life without your wife now? <laughs> That's family wife, family life without wife. Mm. Uh, as I said, people have been very supportive. Mm. I give one example just to, to buttress my point. Mm. 
the very day Arabia died, mm. one of our friends approached me and said, Bro, how are you going to cook now? Mm. Now that Arabia is gone. Mm. But she knew how close we are. Mm. How we do many things together. Mm. Say, how are you going to cook now? I didn't expect the question. I had not even bothered to think of how I would survive. All I did was simply to put my raise my finger said, and I just got it like this, and I did talk. Say that the good Lord would do it. Mm. He said, Yes. The good Lord will support you. Then she turned around. She saw one young man behind her. And thought, young man. Can't you stay with Paul? That young man, she did not know, was one of my staff. He got it of history. Mm -hmm. He had done his masters. And his current was currently at that time was his PhD. Mm -hmm. He was one of my staff. And that one replied, Yes, I will. From that day, for one for more than more than a year, mm -hmm. that guy spent his entire time in the South with me. It was wonderful. Mm. Anything I wanted to do, she supported me. Mm. And then that was what I said. If you receive, you find it very encouraging mm. to be able to keep with life. Mm. Two, the good Lord has been very the good Lord himself has been very supportive. Mm. I can say this without any fear of contradiction. Mm. I've been studying my program before. I became, I was the chief imam and the chairman of the University of Lagos Muslim Community. Mm. I've been to Sudan, I've been to Lebanon, mm. doing my research, I studied Islam, studying Arabic. Mm. When I was in London, I also studied my program mm. with some sheikhs from Morocco. Mm. I've even gone to Damascus mm. with my children. Mm. But then at the death of money, I taught to my Quran. Mm. And I started a fresh study of mm. And that kept me to me mm. yes. mm. So God has been wonderful. Mm. God has been wonderful. What is your typical day like? My day, my day starts. around 11 p.m. or 12 midnight. I wake up. So you go to bed very early? I go to bed early. Mm. I go to bed early. That's how I do previous day. Mm. But when I had some sleep, have some rest, I wake up early in the early hours of the morning. Mm. Early hours of the morning. I reach for my Quran, mm. study it. Until it's about my person and Tahadi prayers. Tahadi is the, the, the prayers we say in the few uh, years. Early hours. Early hours before uh, you see your first prayer. I do that until about 5 30. I had a short sleep again. Say my prayers between 5 30 and 6. Have a short rest before I start the work of the day. Work of the six starts around eight or eight thirty. My staff will be there, the secretary will be there, we tackle problems of the office. We had a series of meetings. That takes me to about four or five thirty in the evening. Mm. After that, I have my dinner back to me. No social life for you now? Social life over the weekends. Mm. Uh especially what people will say. We want to mark our anniversary. Uh, we want to say special prayers. Mm. We want to do this, we want to do that. Come and conduct the prayers for us. Mm. I go there. Mm. Sometimes I send the patients, come and be the chairman, come and be the guest of honor. Mm. Uh, come and do this for us. Mm. I'll go there. Mm. So mm. I social life. And they treat me very well. Ah, Paul, this is your city. I come here, I come here. Hey, I want to see you, I want to talk to me. Mm. Very nice social life. Mm. Uh, but Walk, 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 mm. from Monday to Friday. Mm. 
I see that jogging is one of your hobbies. Yes, it is. Is it still something you, any exercises? I used to jog, but at the age of 80, <laughs> it's no longer too easy to, do, to, to jog. And besides, with all these kidnappings, it's a lot of very careful indeed. Mm. But what I do as of now is just walking. Mm. Uh, I walk. Uh, unfortunately for me, I've been walking before. I remember when I was in service, mm -hmm. I did not drive to I did not drive to school. I rarely walk from home to the classroom. In the, inside the university. Inside the university. Yes. And from the classroom again, I walk back home. Mm. I saw myself as a journey walker. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's easy for me to walk, and mm. I still do a lot of that now. It looks to me that you don't face any health challenges for, for an 84-year-old. With the good Lord, mm. as I said, as I say, the good Lord does something but for to care for me. Mm. <laughs> uh, some people are surprised that I don't use glasses. Some people say they're surprised that I can do this, I can do that. Mm. I thank the good Lord mm. for his innumerable mercies. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Prof, for this very insightful look into your life. I wish you well and uh, in the service of the community and the uh, viewers i hope you enjoyed our conversation with professor tajuddin padomasi professor of history and a leader of the muslim community in lagos until we meet again in another episode thank you and goodbye